Great. Um, and I'd like to introduce my wife of 20 years. Gina, would you stand up? You know, uh, I heard that uh, President Bush spoke here last year, and uh, he was trailing Ann Richards in the polls. And they, so they called me up and asked me if I would campaign. His campaign people called me up and asked if I'd uh, MC his rallies. And I, I said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to. So I, I, so I went on many of his rallies, and so I would get up there and I would introduce him, and I would say, I would like to introduce the next governor of the great state of Texas, George Walker, and then I paused, Walker. I love that name. <laughs> Bush, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and I, also, I also campaigned for his father, uh, George H.W. Bush, in 1988. I got a call from his campaign manager asking me if I would MC a rally in Riverside, California. And I said, uh, Lee Atwater. And I said, well, Lee, I've never done anything like that before, but if President-elect Bush wants me to try, I'll, I'll definitely give it a try. Well, we, I did. And we had like 20,000 people there, and it turned out really, really well. Well, the next thing I know, I'm on the campaign for four months. <laughs> but through that uh, traveling, you know, I became very good friends with former President Bush. And, uh, and he's actually the man that helped me get my Kickstart Kids uh, Foundation going in Texas. 1940, on the Oklahoma border of Texas and Oklahoma. And when I was born, I was born a blue baby, which means I wasn't breathing. And in those days, that was very serious. So they took me into emergency and my mom didn't get to see me for a week. And finally, they, they brought me to see mom and put me in mom's arms. And mom's holding me and she picks me up and says, God has plans for you. Well, my mom's 95 years old and she still says that. <laughs> but uh, I, had, I was ready to test for my black belt. I had to drive to Seoul, which was 40 miles away. And, I, and it's middle of winter. We are freezing. And, we, and we're uh, testing in this big open windowed auditorium. And I'm sitting there in my uniform, freezing to death. I had to wait four hours before my turn to get up and do my form. Well, when I get up and I walk before the board, and they say, okay, Maasai, which is the black belt form. I can't even think of what it is. I've done it thousands of times, but my mind goes completely blank. And I'm just sitting there at attention, and finally they said, go sit down. <laughs> And that was the end of my test. <laughs> so I went back and, you know, really distraught and uh, told my instructor about it. And he, he said, okay, next time you'll be ready. And so anyway, I, I kept training and went back. And this time I did pass my test. And I came back to the States. I'm stationed at March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. Now, back in those days, no one ever seen this arc. This is 1961, and so I'm on the base, and I'm out there, and I'm doing my kicks and punches, and all the GIs are watching me, and they go, man, what is that? So I kind of tell them, they said, we want to learn that. Why don't you teach us that? So I thought, well, maybe I'll start a club here on the base. And I said, then I'm thinking, well, if I, have to, if I go before an audience, I'm going to have to talk. And I'm 21 years old. I have never gotten in front of anybody and talked before. So I thought, okay, I'll write out about a half a page speech. And for two weeks, I'm memorizing this little speech. I'll never forget this. This is 1961, and I can still remember it very vividly. <laughs> and I walk into the gym, and there's like 400 people in there. And the microphone's laying on the floor. I walk up to the microphone, I pick it up, and I say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chuck Norris, and I'd like to welcome you here tonight. That's the last thing I remember. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm walking out in the middle of the gym to do my demonstration. And I'm thinking, did I finish my speech? 
Or did I just lay the microphone down? Well, to this day, I still don't know. But the important thing here is that I finally cracked that egg of insecurity that I had carried for 21 years. And I kept forcing myself after that to, and eventually the egg finally cracked open. And, uh, you know, then, then uh, once I got out of the service, I uh, went to work at North Carolina Craft. I'm, by that time I'm married, I have a, I have a child. And uh, so I go to work at North Carolina Craft and my intention is to be a police officer. So I took my exam for the LAPD and I had like a four month waiting list. So in the meantime, I'm working at Northrop, but that's not enough money to support, to support my family. So I start teaching the martial arts in my mom's backyard to supplement my income. And as I'm teaching there, I fell in love, you know, with, the, with teaching. So two weeks before I joined the, go to the academy, I decide to become a martial arts teacher. So I open up a little school in Torrance, California, with my about six hundred dollars of my dad's borrowed money, and I don't even know how to write a check, <laughs> but that's anything else. So, but anyway, through this, I, uh, you know, I, I was doing fairly well, but I thought, how am I going to get students? I said, well, if I become a martial arts competitor, and if I can win a local tournament, I get my name in the in the, uh, the karate magazines, and maybe that help bring students into my school. That was my motivation to become a fighter. Los Angeles Championships. And uh, I wound up winning the championship there. And I thought that was my goal. My goal was to win that tournament. But then I thought, well, if I can win the LA Open, maybe I can win the state title. So in 1965, I fought for the state title and I won it. I said, well, if I can win the state title, maybe I can win the national title. So I went to uh, New York, fought for the national title, and I won it. Then I thought, well, maybe I can go for the big enchilada, the international championships, which is the biggest in the world. So in 1967, I, I fought in the international championships, and I won it. Yeah. And then what you do there in the internationals is you, you have four weight divisions. I fought in the middle weight division. So I won my weight division. Now the, the fighters in the other weight divisions, we all fight each other for the grand championship. And I wound up winning the grand championship. So I was going to quit. Now I'm going to focus on my schools and teaching. And the promoter says, Chuck, if you win this two years in a row, you get your name inscribed in this big silver bowl. <laughs> I said, man, I could get my name in that bowl. <laughs> so, so anyway, I wound up fighting again in 1968, and I wound up winning the title a second time. And then I was getting ready to quit again. Then I get a call from a promoter in New York City, offering me the chance to fight for the professional world title middleweight title. So I thought about it and I said, do I really want to do this? And finally, I finally said, yes, I will. So I went to New York, Madison Square Garden, and I fought Louis Delgado from Puerto Rico for the world title. And I wound up winning it. Well, Bruce, you know, do you know who Bruce Lee is? <laughs> it, well, anyway, Bruce Lee was there. He was doing the Green Hornet series. And, uh, so anyway, after the, I won the title, he and I started talking, and we were, at the, we were staying at the same hotel. So we walk into the hotel together, and uh, talking about our philosophies and everything, and, we, and I, I still remember, I was on the seventh floor, he was on the ninth floor. As we're going up the elevator, we're really getting into our discussion. As we arrive at the seventh floor, I get out while he steps out with me. And the next thing you don't know, we're working out in the hallway of this hotel. And this is like midnight. And the next day we look, it's four o'clock in the morning. He said, I've got a seven o'clock flight, I gotta get going. So he says, let's work out when we get back to LA. Which we did, we trained together for two years. 
And then he, and then he left for Hong Kong to pursue his move career. So I didn't hear from him for like two years. Then out of the blue, he calls me. Says, uh, Chuck, I've done two movies in Hong Kong and they're really successful. He said, I want to do a movie now with a fight scene that everyone will remember in the Colosseum in Rome. And uh, he says, I want you to be my opponent. So kiddingly, I said, well, who wins, Bruce? <laughs> he said, I win. I'm the star of this movie. Well, well you know, I, I held the world title at the time. And I said, oh, I see. You want to beat up the world champion, huh? He says, no, I want to kill the world champion. <laughs> so which we did. And, and, uh, but anyway, I held on to the title for six years. And then, uh, you know, I, then I had private students. Steve McQueen was one of my students. And once I retired, he said, what are you going to do now that you're no longer fighting? And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'll probably just continue teaching. He says, well, you're, have you ever thought about acting? And I started laughing. I said, Steve, I've never even done a high school play. You know, what makes you think I could be an actor? And he says, I don't know. He says, this, this, this is something. And he said, but I would encourage you to, to give it a try. Well, you know, by that time, my philosophy was, anything I try, I'm going to finish. Once ever I start something, I'm going to finish it by book or crook. I'm going to get it done. So I realized that and I thought, I've got to, let me do some research. So I started doing research about actors in Hollywood. And there were 16,000 unemployed actors in Hollywood. And the average income, counting Barbara Streisand and everybody, the average income is $4,000 a year. That's gotten everybody. And I'm thinking, man, I'm, you know, I'm 34 years old. <laughs> I don't know the first thing about acting. And I go to Steve, and I said, Steve, I, I don't see how it's possible for me to be able to achieve something like this. And he says, now are you telling me, after all the, the years you and I have trained together, that there's something that you cannot do, that something that if you make your mind up, you cannot achieve it? Because you've always said nothing's impossible. I said, well, <laughs> maybe it's not impossible, but it's going to be hard. <laughs> but anyway, I decided. So I go and I start, start checking out acting schools. And uh, they're, they're expensive. You know, and I had no money. So I uh, checked out different nice acting schools. I finally find an acting school I can go on my GI Bill. <laughs> so, producer in Hollywood, I said, I don't know what, I don't know where to go from here. He says, you know, our, our accountant has a producer. I said, really? He says, yeah. I said, well, how old is he? He said, oh, uh, Alan's about uh, 28. I said, oh, Larry, I've, I've had these wannabe producers. I've gone through all of them. And he said, well, let's call. Give him a call. I said, nah. I don't want to. He said, well, I'm going to call him. So Larry gets on the phone, calls the producer's office, Alan Badeau, and gets his secretary and says, I have a friend who has a script that I want your boss to read. She says, okay, we'll send it in. If he, when he gets a chance, he'll look at it. And Larry says, uh-uh, I know how that works. I want your boss to meet my friend, and then he can have the script. So... She said, I don't think that's going to be able to happen. He said, well, ask him if he knows who Chuck Norris, the world karate champion, is. Well, as fate would have it, Alan lived in the same vicinity that I lived in, and so he had heard of me. So he agrees to have dinner. So that night, he and I and Larry and, and his wife go to dinner. And we go downtown to a Mexican restaurant in L.A., and I said, I'll pick up the check. Well, after dinner, I pick up the check and I look. I don't have enough money to pay the check. I said, Larry, do you need to go to the bathroom? Uh-uh. Hey, yes, you do. <laughs> so we go in the bathroom and I said, Larry, I don't have enough for this check. Do you, do you have any money? So he digs into his pockets, pulls it out. We have enough money to cover the check plus one dollar. 
<laughs> well, you know, and anyway, so after dinner, I give out on the, the script, and uh, about four hours later, four o'clock in the morning, he calls me, he says, I like the script, I'm gonna see if I can raise it. Well, Alan got his money from doctors and lawyers in the South Bay area of Los Angeles. So anyway, he takes the script to them, and they said, look, we don't know who Chuck Norris is. We're not gonna invest a million dollars on the unknown. So, so Alan calls me up and says, I'm sorry, Chuck. Uh, they, don't, they don't know who you are, and they, they're not gonna gamble. So I had a desperation. I said, well, can I talk to them? He said, I'll see if I can set up a meeting. There's 10 of them. So he does, sets up the meeting, and I'm thinking, what am I going to say to convince them to invest in this movie. So I go to bed that night with that thought in mind. Early in the morning, I, I had the answer. So I go to this meeting. I said, look, I know you don't know who I am, but there's six million martial artists in America who does. And if only half of them, because in those days, movies don't like $2, uh, only, only half of them go to the movie. I said, you're gonna make money. Well, they invested the money. So I do the movie, good guys wear black. Now, no movie studio wants the movie. <laughs> so what, back in those days, you could four wall, you could, uh, where you could rent the theater, and anything over that rental, you keep the money. So, we, so that's what uh, Alan did. He started renting theaters with 16 prints, and I went up traveling all over the United States. And in those days, of course, I wouldn't be speaking to people at that time like this. I'd get local radio and high schools, things like that. That's where I might live. And, but anyway, going from city to city, starting in El Paso, San Antonio, they were a lot smaller in those days. And uh, we started making money. And after about eight months on the road, going from town to town and all that, we finally are now starting to go to bigger cities. Now Dallas and you know, uh, uh, Houston and so on. And so Alan calls them and says, you know, we're doing really well. Let's do another movie. So I call up one of my black belts who's a writer. And he says, I'm gonna write about you being a world champion. So I do a movie called Force of One. And so I do that movie and now no one wants that one either. So I start the same program, traveling from these small towns. So I fly into El Paso to promote Good Guys Wear Black. Then I fly to Dallas, uh, now you know, promote Force of One rather. And then I fly to Dallas to promote uh, Good Guys Wear Black. So, he said, so I'm going to big cities for good guys, small cities for Force of One. And through that, we, uh, you know, we were able to uh, succeed. And by the third movie, The Octagon, of course, everyone wanted it. But this shows what determination can do in your life. You're not giving up. That every time you hit a roadblock, just say, that's all it is, a roadblock. I'm going to climb over it and keep right on moving.